Mac Power Users, episode 493, My Life is an Edge Case, with T.J. Lilma. Hello, everyone. This is David Sparks, along with my pal, Stephen Hackett. How are you today, Stephen? I'm great, David. How are you? Good, good. And I like the fact that we've got someone on the show we haven't had here for quite a while. Welcome back to the show, TJ Loma. Hey, I'm super happy to be back for the big episode 500 extravaganza. I'm so excited to be on this huge, important episode. <clears throat> Wait, uh, TJ? What number is this? TJ, um, this is 493. Sorry, man. Oh, I, I thought we were just recording early. Yeah, no, no, no. But But we did, once again, make sure that we got you in under 500. TJ has been a guest on the show in the past, but it's been several years since you were last here, TJ. He is a minister uh, now in upstate New York, a super nerd um, who uh, blogs on the internet at Rhymes with Diploma. I like how you did that, by the way. Thank you. That's how I've explained to people how to pronounce my last name for my entire life. And now my son is doing it too. So that's kind of a nice tradition we're, ha- we're handing on. Yeah, he's over at rhymeswithdiploma.com. Some some really nice, insightful technology writing there and over on Twitter at, at TJ Loma. And that's got a U in there, by the way, T-J-L-U-O-M-A. There you uh, go. But uh, just one of my favorite guests on the show, because you've always got an opinion on something you're doing. You're always pushing the envelope <laughs> out there. I love how you do that. Uh, it, it is interesting to me. I've said this on the show before, but we have so many uh, ministers slash monks slash who knows what uh, religious folk listening to the show doing amazing things with their technology. Yeah, you know, I think it's kind of fun. And uh, one of my big claims to fame is that uh, Brett Tarpshire once called uh, things that I do insane, which uh, I I wear as a badge of honor. And uh, (laughs) he also called me the number one reader of his website recently. So I'm going to get that on business cards or maybe a tattoo. Oh, wow. All the way, man. All the way. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, it's been several years, TJ. So I think we need to start just catching up with what your gear is these days. Cause I know that you've, you've had some changes in your life. Yeah. It, it's been, it's been quite a ride. I, uh, I had a 2015 MacBook. Yes. The original. Yes. It only had eight gigabytes of Ram and, uh, that has been my main Mac for, uh, since then I got it in 2015 and Boy, it did not age very well. Uh, mm-hmm. I love the size. <laughs> I, I love the no fans. Oh, no fan is amazing. The one port thing didn't bother me that much. I've got a time capsule for my backups. I had a little hub that I could plug stuff in. But uh, yeah, about two years ago, it really started to be like, mm, this is not good. Uh, and I didn't really want any of the laptops that apple had and the like if i wanted a macbook pro that was the one that i wanted it was going to be like over two thousand dollars and i wasn't going to be thrilled with it and then the 12.9 ipad pro with face id came out and face id and i have an interesting history i was sure i was going to hate it i was sure i was going to hate the notch and so when the iphone 10 came out i actually got the eight like one of the only people in the world. Wow. I, think. I, got, I went with, yes. And my son, uh, long story short, needed a new iPhone. We ended up getting him a 10. And uh, I saw Face ID and I was like, hmm. So I went with the 10S Max when uh, that came out. And as soon as Face ID was a thing, I was like, I want this everywhere. And so when I was looking to replace my laptop, I was like, I don't like the touch bar. I don't like this. I don't like that. I can spend all this money on a laptop, but I'm not going to be happy with it. Or I could get the 12.9 inch iPad Pro with Face ID and be getting like the best one that Apple's making and be happy with it. And so I switched to the iPad. That's kind of that's kind of mind blowing for me because I I know (laughs) what a nerd you are and how much automation stuff you've been doing on the Mac over these years. Yep, and you know I had a Mac Mini in the got a Mac Mini in the basement, and my 2007 iMac that uh, is still chugging along. And I would screen share to those things, and I still had the MacBook if I wanted to use it. But uh, coming to work every day, I was bringing the iPad. Uh, I had a, the Apple keyboard. I uh, now have the Bridge keyboard, and uh, it was great. I, I really, I was, I'm still thrilled with it. I think it's one of the best things that Apple has made. Uh, in a long time. I've always had an iPad and liked it, but this is, 
The 12.9 inch, if you can accept the size of it, it's just so much space. And of course, I was used to a 12 inch MacBook. So it was like, well, this is actually bigger than my laptop. Yeah, I mean, it is a laptop replacement. I think that's what people need to, yeah. to, to kind of to grok on that is if you think it's too big, then it probably is too big for you. Yep. But if you're looking for something to replace a laptop like you were doing, uh, it you know, that extra real estate does help when it's on your desk. Yeah, and, and the side-by-side -side mode is what sold me on the 12.9 because, you know, two apps is really, you know, the difference between one app and two app is, is significant. And being able to use two side-by-side -side like that, that was really that was really key. And it's nice on the bigger iPad Pro, too. I've got the 11-inch, and one is closer to iPhone size, so it's not like full two iPad apps side-by-side, -side, but the 12.9, to your point, you get a much more expansive experience with that larger display. I mean, yeah. you, you get you get one and a half apps on the 11 inch and you get two apps on the 12.9. Right. That's right. That's the biggest difference between the two devices, other than the size, of course. And I really got into shortcuts with, uh, the, you know, that scratched my uh, let me scratch my automation itch. Yeah, uh, I I never used workflow uh, because I was sure that that app was going to die. <laughs> and then Apple bought it and I was like, oh, wait, it's dead. It's dead now. They've hired these people and all those people, Federico, who spent all that time working on the stuff. They are going to be so sad because that app is going away. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> and I was thrilled to be wrong. <laughs> they really went a different direction. Now we, that was a real question. Like, did, are they going to put those people like on the air? You know, are they going to put it on a team supporting, you know, like some hard Hardware. Are they going to switch them over to, you know, pages? You just didn't know, but they actually kept them together and, and made it better. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see what they're doing in iOS 13, but uh, we won't talk about the, stat, the state that iOS 13's in right at the moment. <laughs> yeah. So you're on the beta, right? Yep. I, I have installed the beta and I have regrets. Yeah. Common refrain. You know, I got lulled. I got lulled into thinking public beta means eh, it's pretty much fine. And not this year. So I've actually been kind of scared to even use some of the stuff because it's like, is this going to blow up? On, on my iPhone, I regularly have to just shut it down and uh, restart it to, to like even get the app switcher to work one day. I couldn't even flip up from the bottom. Yeah, it's 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 uh, an adventure this summer. <laughs> yes, leave, yes. Leave it at that. And I had Catalina in, installed for about mm, three and a half minutes yeah. before I went, nope. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's about right. <laughs> so so you've switched out the MacBook was sort of the hub for you, and you, you've now put the 12.9 iPad in its place. Uh, I'm curious, do you feel like you've had to, to shed things to, to make that work? Is there something that you really wish you could do, but you're willing to leave behind for the portability? You know, the, the battery life, I know everybody says it, but the battery life is just insanely good. And just being able to pick it up. I, the, the thing that I missed the most was Keyboard Maestro, uh, which will come as a surprise to pretty much no one who has paid any attention to anything I've done. Uh, and But other than that, I mean, I Pages, I was using Pages on the Mac. I was using Pages on the iPad. I was using bear and ulysses um and some of the automation stuff quite frankly shortcuts can do a few things that i don't know how to do any easier on my mac which surprised yeah. me yeah that that happens i i have a few automations like that as well that just work better with shortcuts than they do with even mm -hmm. keyboard maestro and apple script well you know the, the on the mac it feels like sort of front end like ui automation tools they are willing to fall back to something like scripting languages because they're available. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's just kind of how a lot of these things go. But on the iPad, that's not always an option, right? You can run something like Pythonista, but for most people, shortcuts is as deep as it gets. And so if it feels like shortcuts and that infrastructure has to surface so much more into the UI because there's not another option. It does open doors to people that would be closed on the Mac. I think that's a really interesting thing about shortcuts. And I think we're seeing more people adopt it because it's not intimidating. Like even automator on the Mac can, can feel intimidating in places where shortcuts feels friendly and you're dragging blocks around and you can go deeper if you want, but if you don't need to, it's a, the learning curve I feel like is pretty gentle. And to add to that, I'd also say that shortcuts just goes further than Automator does. I think mm -hmm. people who get Automator, they run out of runway very quickly because it just doesn't do a lot of things that you can with shortcuts. 
Yeah, one of the things with with shortcuts, there were two of them really. One is that Apple has this. Uh, one of their built-in things was for like parsing web pages, and it, it will like get to the body of the uh, web page pretty easily. And you know, there have been tools out there to do that. You know, Instapaper had a formatter and a couple of others, but the one on the iPad is great. And I tried to look it up on the Mac and like to, to use the same service on the Mac is like hundreds of dollars like per month or something. So obviously Apple has some kind of a deal with them. And one of the things I have to do is with the, the day job, though, I use a there's a calendar that's published that has the readings for each Sunday and it tells you the Sunday, it tells you the readings, et cetera. And it's just in this regular calendar format. And on the iPad, I can go through, run a shortcut that was pretty much already there, parse it all out, and then pick up the, the reading title. I can go to another website, get the text of the reading, and throw that all into Bear or Ulysses fairly easily. And again, that's just something I couldn't, I don't know how to do that on the Mac, and I know how to do a lot on the Mac, but this was just easier. So now even when I'm using the Mac and the iPad together, there's sometimes I go to the Mac, uh, I go to the iPad rather, because it's just easier. And, you know, there is that, David, I know you've talked about this, the the delight factor, the, the sort of nice, uh, you know, the niceness of using it, that uh, even when I felt like there was something that I had to do on the Mac, uh, I never really resented it. It was sort of like, okay, well, this is just something I've got to do. Um, I really haven't had a desktop computer for a long time, so I've had laptops. And, you know, sometimes there are things that would be easier to do on a 27-inch iMac, but I don't have one of those either. So, And, and as geeks, it's fun just learning new things, which when you change a platform, it, it forces your brain to find new solutions. And sometimes they're better. But I, we, we're going to do a whole segment on automation because you have so many automation uh, tricks up your sleeve. Um, but I want to to kind of finish this story about your hardware. It didn't end with your acquisition of the iPad, did it? <laughs> no, it did not. Uh, yeah, the iPad and I were, were good close friends for well over a year. Uh, but just in the last two weeks, uh, I have purchased a new uh, MacBook Air. Uh, I, I did manage to buy the MacBook Air uh, just about two weeks before the, they were updated, uh, but the update <laughs> was fairly minor, um, mostly the keyboard, and uh, that was another, I, I had my keyboard on my 2015 MacBook replaced three times. Ooh. That was not fun. Uh, it's now out of warranty, of course, and the 2015 doesn't even... Uh, get covered in any of the uh, service programs anymore. But uh, I, I do, typing on the keyboard, I like. Uh, and uh, I was ready for a new Mac. I was ready to trust again. Uh, and hope mm -hmm. not to, you know, I, I, I knew I'd been hurt. But uh, so, yeah, I now have a 13 inch uh, MacBook Air with 16 gigabytes of memory and a 512 SSD and two ports. Two hey. ports. <laughs> Crazy talk. It's interesting. You, your laptop uh, journey is identical to my wife's. She had a 2015 MacBook. Same story. Multiple keyboard repairs. Didn't age very well. You know, the MacBook got faster over its three revisions before they killed it. But that first one was a bit of a dog. And and she has moved to the new MacBook Air. And she really likes it. And she, she liked the 12-inch size. But I think, you know, turning through her big photos library and stuff was just could be so slow on the old one. She's been really happy with there. I think it's a great laptop, honestly. It, it really is. And, you know, the, the I think the thing I, I will miss the most, the size is probably a close second to not having a fan. I don't know. There was just something about it was almost iPad like, right? Not having this fan. Yeah. And and now with the MacBook Air, when the fans kick on, I'm like, man, eh, I don't really love that. But I also noticed that like the MacBook was getting really slow on stuff, and it's like, I bet, I bet there's throttling happening somewhere. Uh, so it's it's a good thing to have. TJ, yes, you're plugged into all this stuff. You know all the rumors that Apple is getting a new keyboard <laughs> yes. very soon. You know. Uh, I've, chose... I've heard some people don't really like the keyboard. Uh, yeah, yeah, weird. It's been a subtle point, but... <laughs> yeah, and I want to Look, I know some people like the typing. Some people don't like the typing. That's not the issue. To me, is it's it's established that these keyboards fail. I mean, right. you've had three. Um, yep. We've had many guests that have had that. I mean, Apple has extended the warranty program. It's not... There's no doubt that there's some problems with this hardware. I'm just curious why... 
you chose now to buy one? I mean, rather than just wait till whatever the next keyboard is. Uh, there were two reasons. One, I, I had an increasing number of incidents where I felt like I was going to take my 12 inch MacBook and break it in half over my knee. Uh, <laughs> and two, I've got a budget in my professional expenses line for a computer. Uh, and those two things work together to say, you know, I think now's the time. Uh, it, it literally has been like sometime last July, July, 2018, I woke up one morning and I had the, uh, the little flashing, uh, folder icon on my mm-hmm. MacBook. And, uh, and that's bad. That's a bad feeling. Uh, even with someone who has multiple backups of everything, uh, and it would do that every now and again. And I just got to the point where I was like, you know what? I- I'm, it's just time. I'm just, I felt like I was every day was kind of, a a thousand little, you know, things that were being too slow, things that were being frustrating. Uh, and so I was just like, okay, n- now's the time. And honestly, I thought, you know, the keyboard has apparently been improved and they do have the repair thing. So if I have to mail it off, uh, I will say that the times I mailed off uh, my MacBook to get repaired, I mailed it one day, they fixed it the next day, and I had it back uh, the third day. So that's pretty good. I mean, that's not a guarantee, obviously, but I can use my iPad for that amount of time if if it does come up. Um, otherwise, it was just, I was just frustrated is really the answer. Well, you know what? That makes actually sense. I mean, and I think that's the the circumstance where you would do that. It's because you needed one. Yes. Yeah. It was, you wait as long as you can and then buy. And, and like Steven said, I, I do think the new MacBook Airs are pretty great. So I think you're going to be fine. It is interesting, though, that they're selling the new ones and they come with the more extended warranty as you buy it. I mean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that's I think really that's how they were talking uh, on some podcast, some podcast. Was it? Oh, yeah. No, it was actually Mac Power users. Uh, we were talking with Simone about pent up demand. Uh, yeah. But I think part of that uh, covering them is just to say, look, if you if you're looking to buy one, but you're worried about the keyboard, don't worry, we'll cover you. Um, but of course I bought Apple care because I, I'm one of those people. Yeah. Same. Now uh, I know because I have access to the Google doc, but the MacBook air is not the only Mac in orbit at TJHQ. No, no, there are, uh, there are a couple, uh, I've got a, uh, when I went into, uh, my doctoral program in 2007, when I got accepted, I realized I was going to be spending a lot of time in front of a screen. And so I bought an iMac, uh, and that iMac is still going. It can't be upgraded past uh, El Cap, uh, but that's good because I've actually got some automations that require El Cap, <laughs> as will surprise no one. Uh, but that's down in the basement. Uh, right next to that is a, a Mac Mini uh, 2012. It was the good one before it got bad, before it went four years, before it got updated. Uh, I've got one yeah, of those. That, that one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> you, everyone remembers that. You thought MacBook Escape was a hard uh, Surprisingly, <laughs> I completely understand that. And I know? have a, a Mac at uh, Mac Stadium. I keep wanting to call it Mac Mini Colo, but Mac Stadium. Uh, and I've had that for several years and, uh, I switched over. I had a, a Linux uh, server account at uh, DreamHost, and it's just so nice to have your server be a Mac and I can screen share in and do all the things that I need to do. And, uh, that one is, I think 2011 or 12. And that's the, the server model that has two hard drives in it because backups. I feel like we could do a whole show on that, that Mac oh, yeah. stadium. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm really curious about this. Maybe, um, Let's let's put a pin in that because I, I I have questions. Sure, and that and that's the entire sum of your Mac Empire. Uh, well, there's there's still my old 2011 MacBook Air that my son uses, and the sure. 2015 MacBook is still there. It's still you know chugging along. I'm not sure what its fate will be, but uh, I think a clean install might help a little bit. And uh, we'll go from there. Oh, and I should say, my mother, uh, who's mostly iPad now, still has my Black Book. Remember oh, the black yeah. MacBook? Yeah. Every now and again, she needs something that's flash based or something like that. And I pulled it out this past week. She hadn't turned it on in like two years. Um, Safari doesn't work uh, much anymore, but we've got Google Chrome that like something with HTTPS, uh, SSL stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, that so that's still that's still on the edge of the empire, I guess I would say. Yeah. Some some of our younger listeners may be thinking. <laughs> 
Black MacBook. So there's yeah. a link in the show notes to an article I wrote on iMore years ago. Of course there is. Oh, I love you. In the uh, the the MacBook days, they had the white plastic one. But if you had an extra two hundred dollars and you wanted some more hard drive space, but you really wanted to look cooler than all your friends, you got the black one. And I got to say, I have both of them. The black one still to this day looks super cool. My brother had a black MacBook in college. I had and I had like a 15 inch aluminum power book and then a later a MacBook Pro. But he bought that black MacBook, guys. I had jealousy in my heart because it looked so dang cool, and it still yeah. does. So it book. still does. It still does, and that keyboard is still great. Yeah, uh, this, it is. You know, it's it's not Retina, but I mean, if you made a Retina screen MacBook that size and shape, people would love it. Mm-hmm. A- and it didn't turn yellow like the white ones did. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That, that's that's true. true. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking of it. I think the only Mac that I've owned that is no longer in still in service was my original 2003 or four. I bought a, I bought a power book the year before they switched to Intel. <laughs> that was yeah. my first Mac. And uh, when, you know, power PC went away that, that one went away, but I think the rest of them, I mean, it's just a testament to how long the, the hardware can last. This episode of the Mac power users is brought to you by one password. Get 20% off 1Password by going to onepasswordcom slash MPU. 1Password is the perfect solution for managing passwords in your family. It's got applications for the Mac, iOS, Windows, Android, Linux, and even Chrome OS. With a 1Password subscription, you get unlimited passwords, items, and 1 gigabyte of document storage and 24-7 friendly email support. I really love 1Password in my family because it's got the rest of my family using safe password habits. You can get up to five members on a subscription. They just keep adding features like travel mode to help you safely cross borders, two-factor authentication for an extra layer of protection, and the ability to share passwords, credit cards, and secure notes safely. My wife and I, and my kids even, use the sharing of 1Password passwords all the time. It's a great way to have safe and secure passwords and, at the same time, convenience. Once you set up a family account, you can manage what family members see what, so you don't have to give the banking website to the 12-year-old, but you can give them the Netflix account. It just works. Uh, You can recover accounts for locked out family members and uh, just really manage your passwords. And the gang at 1Password just keeps delivering with additional features and content. For instance, right now, if you go to blog.onepassword.com, they've got this cool set of webinars they were doing where they've got the videos available. One of my favorites is the one by Alex Rossier, and it's about phishing, fraud, and threat reduction. And you know what? This is a real problem. I continue to get phishing attempts. I'm pretty smart about this stuff. I make a podcast about technology stuff, but I know there's a lot of people in my family that can easily get caught in these traps. And watching this video really helped. I even passed the link around a little bit. Um, So, you know, they just keep helping out with making the software better and getting that information out there. So get your family signed up for 1Password. Head over to onepassword.com slash MPU and make sure that MPU is in all caps and you'll get 20% off your subscription. Thank you, 1Password, for all of your support of the Mac Power users. All right. So you've got all these Macs running. Yes. How are you? What, what's the software you're using these days? I mean, you're a guy that's always looking for the latest and the greatest. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was pretty settled on screens. Uh, that had been a great app. But uh, last, I think Black Friday, they had a deal on Set App, you know, the subscription service. Yeah. And I, w- I was really skeptical about Set App. I don't know why. I just was like, eh, I'm not sure. But the, the discount was, I think it was like 20 or 30%. And uh, I signed up for set up because I knew there were a couple apps in there that I did not have and would like. And one of them was called jump desktop. Never yeah. heard of it before. And it's, it's better. It's, it, it's got the same type of thing where you put the little app on and it will connect you even when you're not at your home network. And I've been out with my iPad and trying to connect to my home computers. And for some reason, jump works more often than, uh, screen says, and of course, uh, back to my Mac, uh, RIP. And it, it's it's got some really cool features about you know being able to automatically adjust the uh, screen resolution of the Mac you're connecting to, so it can fill your iPad screen, so you don't have that like letterboxing effect, uh, which can be really nice. Um, and so yeah, that I've been really impressed by that, uh, and and use that quite a bit. 
Uh, I used got, to use that. I used to use that app for my when I was at the old firm, and I had to remote into a PC. And Jump Desktop was the best solution at the time for going to a PC. But I switched to screens once I no longer had to work with a PC. I haven't used that app for years, so I, I'm glad it's still in development. Yeah, and and the nice thing is if you do get set up, both screens and jump test up are in there, so you can you know try it out, see which one works better for you. Uh, I don't claim to understand why one of them works better than another in the same type of situation, but you know gremlins. Yeah, so so explain that. So, so some folks are listening, and uh, and you know what are you remoting into, and and what are you remoting from, and what are the circumstances that get you to do that, and and I guess. The bigger question is, and we I want to get back around to that Mac Stadium thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, so the Mac Mini that I've got in my garage has no monitor connected to it. Uh, so I'll screen share into that just, you know, when I have to do something there. Um, I will screen share into uh, the, the iMac. Uh, the iMac runs uh, Audio Hijack. I've got it set up so that it uh, automatically records uh, live shows. Uh, for ATP and the relay network. And uh, I'll just uh, jump on there and make sure that uh, Audio Hijack is working correctly. Uh, I will go to, again, Mac Stadium if I need to, you know, I just had to update my um, uh, secure certificate for the website there and uh, do some other stuff that the I've got enough hard drive space that the Mac Stadium Dropbox account has like all my files downloaded on like a two terabyte account. Whereas, you know, my laptop, obviously I don't have all everything downloaded. So if I just need to check something real quickly, sometimes I'll jump into that. Uh, yeah. So, and, and really I'll, I'll jump into it from either the iPad uh, or my uh, MacBook uh, if I'm out and, you know, just need to check something or, you know, my son will tell me that the son's at home and he's like, oh, the network's being slow. And so I'll screen share it and try to see if I can figure out what's going on. You know, so so Mac Stadium, I believe they're in Nevada. Um, Stephen, you you guys work with them. Mac Mini Colo was in Nevada, but I think Mac Stadium's in even more yeah. places. I think they're, they've got several locations. Yeah, the, the Vegas is sort of like the the most well known one, but yeah, they have several co location spots now. So you can even set up with them to have like a Mac, you know, distributed Mac stuff. So you have build servers or file servers that are mirrored across data centers. It's really cool stuff. Okay, and so what it does is for listeners who are not familiar with it, uh, the Mac Mini has got that nice small footprint. So this is a particularly appropriate device for it. So companies quite often like Relay FM will buy a Mac Mini and then they will plug it in at the at the company at Mac Stadium. So mm -hmm. it's it's a room just imagine a room full of Mac Minis connected to the internet. And the advantage is that they keep it there, it's always powered on and you can access it remotely from anywhere in the world. And like like Relay I believe you guys use it for the live shows, correct? The, the live streaming server was there, and we also use it, uh, the way TJ mentioned, is I have a Dropbox account signed up on that, that every shared Dropbox folder, so like each podcast on the network has their own shared Dropbox folder where they sync files, all yeah. of those get synced to the uh, the Mac Stadium machine as just a, another level of backup, because then that machine gets time machined and, and backblazed as well. So it's, uh, it's a place for us to stick files as well, which is uh, handy. Okay, so and that makes sense. You guys run a company. You got many podcasts. TJ is yeah. a guy working out of his house, and <laughs> yes. th there's a part of me, TJ, that wants so much to buy a Mac Mini and send it to Mac Stadium. I just, yes. I just want to say I have a Mac in Nevada that I can access at any time, and I'm begging to justify a reason to do it, and I just never find one. So tell me. What are you doing? I'm so happy to, to have this information for you. So yeah, I've got, I have rather than set up automation on my uh, MacBook or on my iPad, I've got an always on Mac with super high bandwidth. So I have uh, shortcuts on my uh, iPad. I'm, I'm gesturing with my hands now, which you can't see because I'm, I'm so excited. I have shortcuts on my iPad that'll save a URL to a text file in my 
uh, Dropbox, and that file will get picked up by my Mac Mini Colo, sorry, Mac Stadium machine, and it will download the file and save it to Dropbox so that it's automatically on all of my Macs when I get back to them. Uh, I've got Hazel rules running. I've got uh, Launch D uh, stuff going. I've got my website, uh, all of my websites actually, um, using the, the server app, which Apple keeps deprecating and deprecating, but still works. I've got a bunch of those on there uh, that I run through the server app. Uh, I've got, again, I've got some automations uh, for things that I want to record and just don't have to worry about like, am I going to have enough bandwidth for this? Or, uh, you know, if I want to, um, I run a Plex server off of it. Nice. Uh, so I, <laughs> yeah, because why not? Um, and uh, so I, what, I download uh, my, uh, Let's well. This is gray area, guys. I'm downloading my stuff from iTunes, and uh, then magic happens, and then uh, it goes into my Plex uh, account because uh, I'm happy to pay for the stuff, but I want to be able to watch it wherever I want. And the nice thing about Plex is I can cache the stuff onto my iPad if I want to, or just access it wherever. Uh, I mean, there's just so many things I've got going on on that uh, on that uh, iMac on that Mac Mini rather. And uh, yeah, it's just super. And, you know, for what I was paying for hosting before, it really wasn't that much more to do this. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's just this always on super fast Mac and I'm running a 2011, 2012 model, uh, which Steven, remember at one point you mentioned that your, uh, the Mac mini for relay was using a USB, uh, dongle for ethernet yep. <laughs> still is <laughs> that was a key for me because i was having some problems with mine and i said to them hey could you try switching me to a usb and it worked and i was like oh thank you steven <laughs> so <laughs> who knew that that was going to be uh, the key but uh yeah it's just it's just one of these things that's always on i've got uh here's here's a big one too uh, i use something called resilio sync which is a terrible name it used to be called BitTorrent sync and they renamed it uh and it's basically like dropbox but there's no cloud uh so my mac mini at mac stadium is like where all that stuff syncs to so i can sync folders that aren't in my dropbox folder uh, so i can sync my downloads folders because if i download an app on one mac i'm probably going to want to install it on my other mac so my downloads folder syncs so it's, it's kind of your own offsite backup as well Absolutely. I run yeah. ARQ, the ARC backup. Uh, I run, I back up my Macs there. Uh, and then that Mac Mini Co Mac Stadium machine gets backed up to Backblaze. So my backups are backed up. I mean, quite often the folks I know that, that use it and love it are people that, that don't have an always on Mac in their home already. Yes. I mean, that that's one of the keys. Like for me, because I have an iMac that's running 24 seven, I, I pull off a lot of those tricks just with the Mac that's already here. But like, I remember at one point, I don't know if he's still doing, but I think like um, Federico Vitici, cause he was doing everything on his iPad, had a Mac mini running at Mac stadium that he was doing some offsite automation on and, or people who primarily work on laptops. It's great because when you have a laptop, the lids close and things don't happen. Yep. Um, the other thing I've heard people do with it is people who go crazy with Apple mail rules. Um, you have an instance of Apple Mail running on your Mac Stadium, Mac Mini. And so it's applying rules, basically creating your own rule system without turning your email over to Google or somebody else to, to do that for you. Yes, I ran uh, Spam, Spam Sieve. Is that how you pronounce yeah. it? Uh, yeah. I ran that on there for a while before I switched over to FastMail. Yeah, so it, I, I, I'm still not, I don't think it's probably, it's probably something I don't need at this point, but, but I'm always interested to hear how, you know, I guess I would say quote unquote normal folks are using it, you know, not for like a big company like Relay and boy, it sure is tempting. I just love the idea of it, you know? Well, yeah, and again, having, having had a shell account with, you know, Linux and there were just enough differences in Linux on the command line stuff. And of course, everything you were doing was command line. That it was like, oh, well, this doesn't work over here, and that, and now having one one operating system forever. Uh, I also had a Synology for a while, and I'll tell you, the Mac Mini just replaced that too, because again, that was the Plex thing and the backups and everything. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just so nice to have one operating system for everything. Yeah, and to me, there's like no doubt that if I were to do this, it would be a Mac Stadium Mac, because then I can install Hazel and Keyboard Maestro and all the automation coolness. 
and having it do actual file management for me and processing that just with Linux machine, I don't think is even possible and certainly not possible at my pay grade. <laughs> sure. Yeah. One thing I noticed was conspicuously absent in this conversation about multiple Macs and sync uh, is iCloud. Is that, is that, are you relying on iCloud for anything or have you uh, rolled your own everywhere? Oh, iCloud. I, I, I want to love iCloud. I've, I've got my photo library is through iCloud. I, I, I just don't trust it. I, I, um, I want to, uh, but I'm, you know, I've been around long enough that I remember the mobile me days. And so I only use iCloud pretty much for something that's like actively in use between my iPad and my uh, Mac, if like a page document or something like that, that I'm, I'm working on right now. But um, I'm just looking at my iCloud drive now and it it's pretty barren. There's not a whole lot in there. Um, and one of the things that the biggest thing for me with Dropbox, well, two things. One is their revision system where you can go in and like click on this file and then show me all the versions of it. I, with I rely uh, with on Dropbox, that. you mean? With Dropbox, yes. I rely on that in Dropbox and iCloud Drive supposedly has something kind of like that, but I've never really used it. And the other thing with Dropbox is that smart sync feature where not just selective sync, where you can say, don't sync this folder or sync this folder, but with their smart sync, you can say like, show me this folder, show me this folder or file, but make it a placeholder and then only download it if I click on it. And that is a awesome feature. And with the recent, well, everyone referred to it as a price increase for Dropbox, but that feature actually came down uh, to the, the regular people tier. And that's actually going to save me money because I can drop down, I think it's like three terabytes and I, I don't need that much. So I can go down to like the two terabyte level. And that that works so well um, for saving uh, space on my laptop that uh, that's really huge for me. And, and pretty much everything I've, you know, Dropbox is so simple. It's just one folder that syncs. And iCloud Drive looks like one folder that syncs, but really it's like a bunch of different folders somewhere hidden in the library folder that kind of linked, kind of not. Um, I do have uh, documents and, and uh, desktop uh, syncing turned on uh, between my Macs, again, because I might be you know jumping between one or the other. Uh, and because I don't use it that extensively, it, it seems to work okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have not jumped into the uh, iCloud lifestyle. The, the Dropbox, I think they call it, select, it's not Selective Sync, but whatever it is where it's... Smart Sync, I think. Smart Sync, where it's the Mac just basically has a representation of it and you don't have it till you download it. That's something that I've played with in the past. And for some reason, and maybe it's just the way I've used Dropbox forever, but I'm curious how the both of you think about this. I tend to view Dropbox as like my active file system and I have like external SSDs for archival stuff. But really looking at what I have on my external SSDs and how much Dropbox space I have, I could store almost everything on Dropbox and then just have it sort of offline, you know, from my local machine. But I, I like having all of the actual files because it means I can I can back them up and I don't, you know, without using a home server or something to sync them all. And I just I wonder how many people are out there are really taking advantage of this feature in Dropbox or like, hey look, you could throw a ton of stuff here, but you can still make it a very tiny footprint on your laptop. And I wonder how many people are really exploring that at this point. Well, I'll tell you two things. Um, it screws up uh, Time Machine uh, because Time Machine gets very confused with those placeholder files. Uh, so I had to uh, specifically exclude that from uh, my Time uh, Time Machine backups. And again, I'm not worried about that because it's all on the Mac Stadium machine. Uh, it also seems to confuse Super Duper um, but uh, I've moved over to Carbon Copy Cloner. And again, these are two great apps, two great developers. You can't go wrong with either one of them. But in my experience, SuperDuper did have some problems with those placeholder files. Uh, and of course, that whole thing has gotten so much harder now with, uh, I think, in Mojave, the way that like access happens and, and all these other things that uh, that's a harder job for those guys recently. But uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, I am... Uh, I have so many files in my Dropbox that I get an email from Dropbox support one day saying, uh, pointing me to a, a file in their help desk system saying, uh, yeah, there are limits to how many files you should keep in Dropbox. And I'm well over it. 
Uh, so that does, when I set it up on a new machine, it's like four days before the whole thing is uh, <laughs> up to date. So yeah, I, I think, you know, there are some issues with using it as your, you know, everything box uh, that people should be aware of. And so a couple, I'm on the other side of it a little bit. A couple years ago when I got serious about using the iPad a lot more, I just went ahead and, and turned my file system from Dropbox to iCloud. Mm-hmm. And um, it, I find it a lot easier moving between mobile and Mac, just using Apple's system, frankly. Um, I've not had any file loss to my knowledge, and I'm pretty careful about it. Um, but there's just different philosophies. Like, for instance, the iCloud storage has that thing. Like, I'm, I don't own a laptop, but I, I have a loaner from someone. It's a long story. But so I've been using it a little bit off and on lately. And, like, I don't like it because I have it saying just, you know, select, basically the iCloud version of Selective Sync. But it doesn't know what the right ones are to selectively sync. I don't have a button I can press to say this folder always keep up to date. And so quite often I find myself somewhere where I don't have what I need on my device. Whereas with Dropbox, you get to kind of tell it what to do. Yes. Um, and there, the, there are um, a couple of apps for the, uh, for iCloud with that. Uh, one is called Bailiff, uh, by eclectic, eclectic light.co. That's Howard Oakley's site, I think. Uh, and there was an older one called iCloud control, uh, that you can find on GitHub. I can get you links for both of these for the show. Yeah, notes. I'll, I'll check them out. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, you're right. It's definitely easier on Dropbox to, to control that sort of thing. Cause Apple wants to just sort of make it work magically and they can't, I mean, it's just, nobody could, but I, I understand where they're coming from because a lot of users don't want to be that fiddly. You know? Exactly. And, and, but I do, you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm an outlier. Um, right. So I don't know, but I think iCloud gets a, a bum rap at this point because it, it is pretty stable and I've, I've just not really had many problems with it and the, they're catching up, you know, the, the shared folder thing coming with uh, Catalina. I'm very curious to see how well that works, but even like I'm working on a new field guide, I've got an editor working with me. We just set up a shared Dropbox folder because it's just. You know, I mean, it's just it's an easy groove to fall into because you just know they'll work. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by Text Expander. Text Expander is one of those tools that simply boosts your productivity no matter where you are on the Mac, Windows, iPhone or iPad or even Chrome. Because with Text Expander, you can turn things that you type often into snippets and use them anywhere and everywhere that you type. Your time is too valuable and life is too short to constantly retype common phrases, common words, common sentences that you could just make a snippet. And it's not just for individuals. You can use Text Expander with your company through Text Expander for Teams, for things like customer support, reports, email, or anywhere else you need consistent and accurate text. If you have common language that your employees need to send out to people or even use internally, you could bundle those up into a bunch of snippets and make sure that everything everywhere is the same. Like I said, Text Expander is available for Mac OS, Windows, iPhone, iPad, and Chrome. And head on over to the website. You can learn a lot about different things you can do with Text Expander. Uh, Jeff Gamet has this really awesome thing about podcast workflows. There's things for professors, presenters, all sorts of different uses of Text Expander. Once you dig into it, you'll really discover that it's pretty much endless, the things you can do with it. If you visit textexpander.com slash podcast, you can learn more, and show listeners will get 20% off their first year. Once again, that's textexpander.com slash podcast for 20% off your first year, and be sure to tell them you came from the Mac Power users. All right, TJ, you've been teasing us with some of your automation tricks that you've been up to lately. <laughs> I, I, I want to dig into them deeper. One of them you had mentioned you were using shortcuts to trigger Hazel to trigger your Mac in Nevada. I mean, what are you what are you doing, man? <laughs> well, I think uh, I may be one of the uh, you know you've heard of the multi pad lifestyle. Uh, yeah. I may be the first person who's entered into the multi Luna display lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have a uh, a mini display port one hooked up to my Mac mini in the basement and I've got a USB-C one that I'll plug into the MacBook Air. Uh but it's Luna isn't really de- designed for this again. My life as an edge case. Um so I set up a, a keyboard maestro shortcut so that when I plug in the 
a USB-C into my MacBook Air, it will quit Luna Display on the Mac Mini uh, over the local network. And then when I unplug it, it will launch it again. So that way I can always know which one of my uh, Macs I'm gonna hook up with uh, Luna Display, which uh, everyone, well, I imagine most podcast folks have heard about by now, but uh, it's it's a super app. Uh, the, the dongle I think is $60, $70, but it's totally worth it if you are wanting to do this. I'm using it right now as a second screen on my MacBook Air and uh, it, it's just awesome. Uh, I've got, uh, yeah, I've got uh, YouTube stuff. Uh, again, I think this Google would probably tell you this is a moral gray area for me. It's just easier. Uh, if I find something on YouTube that I want to download and watch later, I've got a shortcut that will save the URL to a text file and my uh, Mac mini will pull that up and open the URL in Downey, uh, D-O-W-N-I-E. Uh, which you can buy separately, but it too is involved in set app uh, and it will download video from pretty much any website you can find. Sure. And again, that video gets saved to a Dropbox folder. So it's on all of my Macs if I want it. And that's just handy for those things where it's like, you know, somebody's posted a, a video link on Twitter or something and I want to watch it, but I don't have time to watch it now. And I really wish there was a better way of doing a watch later list, but um, Plex had one and got rid of it, which I still don't understand. And YouTube, if they have one, I, I can't find it. All right. So let's let's unpack that a little bit for folks listening. Sure. Um, so you're on an iOS device and you see a YouTube video you like. So yes. your, your automation with shortcuts, my guess would be grabs the URL from your current web page. Exactly. And saves that to a text file. Correct. A text file somewhere on the cloud, probably in Dropbox. Um, yep. And then on your Mac, you've got Hazel running. Correct. Okay. And so so then what happens with Hazel? Rather than me, you explain it to folks. What happens? What does Hazel do? So, so on Hazel, there's just a little uh, short little shell script that looks in the file for URLs, anything that starts with HTTP, and uses the open command and sends that HTTP link to Downey. And Downey is just set up so that when it gets a URL, it will automatically download the best version of that uh, to uh, Dropbox, uh, a videos folder in my Dropbox uh, account. And then it deletes that file uh, because it doesn't need it anymore. So every time the shortcut runs, it's creating a new file. And when Hazel sees that that file exists, it processes it and then throws the file away. Yeah, and, and I would say one modification I'd make if you'd want to do it without running a shell script, which some people just don't know how to do, sure, is you could have a, a, a folder that is only for the purpose of this script. Yes. So you could have Hazel watching any file that appears, any text file that appears in this folder, then grab the URL out of it. And that would be a way to do it without a shell script. But yeah, that's that's cool. So and then are you, so using your um, your Mac Stadium Mac yes. to do that. Yep, absolutely. Because it's got the biggest bandwidth. Yeah, great. So that's the one that goes to your goes to YouTube, grabs it, and then saves it to your Dropbox. Yep. And I've got another a very similar one. Actually, it's one script that. Uh, it checks to see if the URL is a YouTube link or not a YouTube link. And if it isn't, it just tries to download whatever the URL is. So if I see a, a zip file or something like that, that, you know, a new app I want to try or something, uh, and then I'll just download it and it's automatically on my Mac. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, YouTube, YouTube does have a watch later playlist. So it is kind of buried in their app, but the way you've done it is uh, agnostic. So it doesn't even have to be just on YouTube, right? Anything that has a URL, this thing should be able to go find. Well, and I should say that, that that process doesn't end there because that folder where all the videos get stored um, on my Apple TV, I have an app called Infuse, I-N-F-U-S-E, uh, that can connect to Dropbox and show me videos that have been stored in there. So I can watch my watch later list. I can watch on my Apple TV. Uh, which is very cool also. That is cool. Anytime you can avoid the YouTube Apple TV app, it's probably a wise choice. I hate that app so much. It's not good. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Don't, uh, don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my daughter was watching on the Apple TV, YouTube on the Apple TV, and it just, I, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, I am so screwed because now YouTube, because it's on my account, right? So all my recommendations have just... All your recommendations are mm -hmm. off, yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I leave it signed out of any particular account on our Apple TV, or that would happen yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, you know that they're talking about having profiles on the Apple TV app in the fall, right? That's that's something that's supposed to be coming. I want mine to be pin protected. So that my family can't be lazy and just use my, <laughs> my Netflix select suggestion. My wife has watched a, a couple of, um, uh, let's say, uh, serious family drama shows. And my recommendations are all screwed up with <laughs> on Netflix because of that. And because I'm the first profile, I should have made myself the last profile. But I think mm-hmm. it defaults to like the last one that was in use. So, yeah, yeah. I want to I want a pin code. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you got. You got you from shortcuts to Nevada, and you're getting your videos downloaded. I like that one. Yep. Anything else cool you're doing with shortcuts since you've had this uh, experiment with the iPad Pro that you really uh, want to share? Uh, well, I've got uh, shortcuts. Uh, I've got a bunch of them for for things like that. I'm I'm actually going to switch over here and see if I can uh, pull them up right now. Oh yeah, so I've got uh, a couple of um, cool ones on the. Again, this is something that uh, uh, the iPad is really fun for. I've got a, a shortcut where, if I need to email a committee uh, at the church, I've got a, a on my Mac. I'll go in and create a contact group and put the people in that contact group. But on the iPad, I can I set up a shortcut where we'll look for a contact group pull out email addresses and start an email, a new email to that group. So rather than having to go back through my uh, old emails and try to find the last time I emailed these people and that sort of thing, uh, I can just pull up a new one uh, to do that. And that ends up being something that uh, is very handy uh, several times a week. I've got the one uh, that I mentioned before about... um, uh, downloading stuff. (laughs) I've got one that... This is kind of weird. I've got uh, the the overhead light in our bedroom. The only switch for it is next to the um, the door, and then I have to like walk around. So I've got I've got a shortcut on my iPhone that turns the flashlight on for thirty seconds because it gives me enough time to get into bed without stubbing my toe on the bed. Um, so yeah, I mean I've got just you know a little bit of one. I've used uh, Federico's got some ones uh, that he does with uh, Do Not Disturb that are very handy. Um, you know, for how much time do you want to do not disturb to, to run and things like that. Uh, Steven, I've got yours here for managing iTunes subscription, which just opens that URL that no one can ever find, uh, for managing your iTunes subscriptions. Um, you know, well, one of the, one of the ones that, uh, I, I, th- I think I'm most proud of probably my most complicated, uh, is I, I use, uh, Google voice on my, uh, iPhone and uh, that's and I that's the number that I, I give everybody at the church. It's got a local uh, area code and things like that. So it's a local phone number. And if I want to make a call through it, uh, I need to I, I need to use a you know I have to go into the app and then uh, you know find the person in that contact. So it's it, you're losing a little bit of convenience because I just can't go into my contacts and like tap on the contact and make it uh, make it go. And what I found was that I very often would think, oh, I need to call somebody tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I could write a little reminder. Well, what I did, I ended up writing a shortcut that will um, open up my contacts, at, let me pick out the number, if they've got a home number, a cell phone number, a work number. And then it'll ask me if I want to call, make the call through the regular phone app or the Google Voice app. And it's actually called GV Connect has a URL scheme support. So if I want to make the call through Google Voice, it will create the URL specifically for um, the GV Connect. And when that, uh, so when that reminder comes up the next day in Do, that wonderful app that we've mentioned before, D-U-E, and I swipe to clear off the thing, it will pop up saying, hey, do you want to open this URL? And I say yes, and it makes the call in Google Voice. And it's just one of these things that I use very often. It's It took me probably an hour to make it the first time, but it's one of those things every day I can make it a little easier. And it's so much easier when you think of a call, at least for me, when I think of a call that I need to make, if I can sort of front load all the work into right now and then make it easier for 
future me to actually make that call, when that reminder pops up and it's already got the phone number and I know I just have to do the thing, I'm much more likely to make the call right then than, oh, I've got to go look up the number and whatever. And I don't know. I'm just terribly lazy, I guess is the point. That's a resistance. We all deal with it. And if you can eliminate it through automation, more power to you. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, Google included URL support for that because it, it makes sense because that should be something that you can do natively on the system. I'm actually really curious. Um, you have to let me know offline with the new shortcuts because they've, they're they really trying to remove right. URL schemes. You know, they're trying to make it. I mean, you are a geeky guy, so you figured out you could find a URL scheme to make that call. There's a lot of people that would have never even imagined that was possible. Well, and um, this is a third party Google Voice app. So I mean, yeah. this is pretty, you know, you've got to you've got to want this pretty badly to get it to work. Yeah, so I'm I'm just curious as as Apple pushes, will that be a discoverable something that's easier than setting up a URL scheme going forward? Yeah. I, I hope so. Ide- ideally it would, but I, I don't know if we're gonna get there immediately. Yes. And then you're also, but but you still got the Mac and you say you're kind of well known for some of the cool keyboard maestro stuff you're doing. So I would imagine that new MacBook Air got keyboard maestro loaded up on it pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. It, it was, you know, I blame you actually as part of the reason that I uh, I did end up coming back to, to the Mac for uh, your keyboard maestro field guide. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> it was just one of those things where I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's so nice to be able to just press, you know, five keys or, you know, the hyper key and, and something and, and and have stuff, you know, just happen automatically. Uh, and, you know, and this is why the spouses of our listeners hate me, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it, it really is like I've got it set up where, uh, you know, I, I launch as few apps as possible when I first log into my Mac. Again, this happened when you were using a four-year-old MacBook that was underpowered. Uh, and then I've got a palette uh, and Keyboard Maestro that will uh, run a, a thing called, you know, like launch login apps. And that will run like Dropbox and all the other usual suspects that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll run once I've uh, once I've been you know logged in, so I can start doing whatever I'm doing, and then let all those apps sort of start themselves in the background. Um, I've got you know shortcuts for uh, jumping around uh, with Jump Test Up. Uh, I can hit one key and it will show me uh, all my Macs, and I just press a number and it will connect to that different. Um, that different uh, uh, Mac. And one of the, uh, this this app is one I've just recently added to my uh, toolkit is called Power Manager. And if you look at their website, it looks like they've been around for a long time, but this is an app that I I don't think I've ever heard about. Uh, I think I've come across it a few times and hadn't looked at it really closely. It's $50. I just want to say that right up front. And in, in today's age of, you know, dollar apps or free apps or anything like that, $50 just seems like such a huge amount. Uh, they do have uh, education academic discount for folks who might qualify for that, but um, they've got a 30 day trial and I, I'm just a couple days into it and I'm pretty sure I'm going to buy it because it can do, it can do some uh, things like um, you can do with Keyboard Maestro as far as running things at a certain time of day, you know, run this shell script or launch this app or things like that. But it also does some things that uh, Keyboard Maestro can't even do. Like it can run a, a script when you switch uh, from your uh, laptop battery, uh, from the plug to the laptop battery. So I've got just a little growl notification that pops up and says, hey, you're on battery now in case you didn't notice that you... Uh, and I've got it set up where if my laptop gets down to like 5%, uh, power manager will just shut it down cleanly because, uh, what I had happen was my, uh, I left it unplugged one night and I had drives plugged into the USB C and I couldn't turn it back on without unplugging one of the drives. And it turned back on and said, Hey, you ejected that drive badly. And so I've just set it up so that if it gets that low, it's just going to shut down uh, the Mac nice and cleanly. And uh, I, I think that's a, a power user tool. Uh, it's got power right in the name. Uh, and uh, it also <laughs> uh, but it also does yeah. stuff with uh, if you've got a Mac connected to a UPS, 
Uh, it can do things, you know, when you switch on to UPS. And I've got a UPS and it came with some software, but it's terrible. Yeah. Uh, and and this, this is, you know, one of the things that I didn't even realize when I was looking into this is that it does have some stuff with, um, for UPS. For, for example, like mine will run a, a script when it UPS like goes on to battery power, but it won't run another one when it switches back to AC power. So I get this notification that, you know, my UPS is now on battery power, but it could have been a minute or it could still be on there 30 minutes later. And I've got no way of knowing until I like screen share in and see, you know, is this thing running or not? Uh, and so I, 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 I always like finding a new app that, uh, and again, they seem to have been around for a long time. And, uh, but, um, maybe, uh, maybe some other folks would be interested in that as well. No, this wasn't on my radar either until you told me about it. And it, it's powerful. I'm looking yeah, at the website it. Right it does now. a lot of stuff. And it's got a very, very easy to use uh, GUI for folks who maybe, you know, aren't as comfortable with getting into stuff. But it also has like a, an advanced editor mode where you can really, you know, get down into the nitty gritty. Yeah, this, this looks great. So, so you're still automating is what I'm getting from this. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, that the, I'm still using, I think last time I was on, I, I just started this, uh, I've got a set of scripts that will download and install updates, uh, yeah. for applications. I'm still using that. And again, one of the nice things is I run that on my, um, Mac stadium Mac. And yeah. if it, uh, when it downloads a new file, it ends up on my download folder in all of my Macs. And I go, Oh, there's a new version of this. Um, and I just, you know, can just install it there as well. And uh, so that makes things easy, which I always like. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Direct Mail, where you can create and send great looking email newsletters. Go to directmailmac.com slash MPU to get 10% off when you sign up for a full feature plan. Direct Mail is an easy to use email marketing app designed exclusively for the Mac to help you create and send great looking email newsletters. Email marketing is still an incredibly cost effective way to reach your customers and grow your business. And for the past 15 years, Mac users around the world have trusted the Direct Mail app to handle all of their email marketing needs. It's designed just for the Mac which means it's fast and easy to use and works great with other apps and services you already use. With Direct Mail, you can quickly and easily compose high quality emails that look great on your mobile device and desktop. You can also grow your mailing list by creating email signup forms that you can add to your website or Facebook page. You can even have email campaigns sent automatically without you lifting a finger. And that's just a few of the features you get with Direct Mail. One of my favorites is that they have real human live chat customer support available to answer your questions. And Direct Mail is the number one top rated email marketing app for the Mac with five star reviews on the App Store, GitHub, and elsewhere. And it's trusted by small businesses, nonprofits, schools, and even Fortune 500 companies alike. Direct Mail is free to download and get started, and Mac Pow users listeners can save 10% off all of the full feature pricing plans. Head over to directmailmac.com slash MPU to check it out. That's directmailmac.com slash MPU to get 10% off when you opt for a full feature plan. Our thanks to Direct Mail for their support of the Mac Power users and all of Relay FM. All right, so TJ, when we were talking about the show today, I said, hey, let me know a few apps that you like using. And you sent me uh, basically a catalog here. <laughs> <laughs> and these are just the ones that I don't think people know enough about. Yes, and I want to talk about some of these because I think that's one of the goals for the show is to introduce folks to apps that they're not aware of. So uh, let's, you've got, we got Mac apps, we've got iPad apps. Let's, let's spend a little bit of time talking about some of these. Okay. Um, one, uh, that, uh, I'll have to admit I'm friends with the guy that makes it, but I feel like it doesn't get much love in the world is card hop. I see that you're a big card hop user. Oh, card hop is so awesome. You know, we've had this thing with, with fantastic Al could, you know, take natural language and turn it into a calendar event. And all I wanted was something to do that with contact information. You know, people have a signature file or there's something on their website where they've got all their information. And what do you have to do? You have to copy like 15 times to get it from their website into your contacts. And then card hop, card hop came along and it was like, no, just copy all the stuff. And it's made by the same people who make Fantastic Al, right? It's, 
Yeah, you select the stuff and it pops up a window and it says, here's how I've parsed it. Is this correct? And it's like 90, 95% there. And then, you know, you do a few things and you tap on it and it's in your contacts and it's just fantastic. And it's just one of those little things that it, it makes it so much easier to add someone to your uh, contacts list. And this is something you, we're going to want to do now because I think one of the features that every Mac Power user is looking forward to is when iOS 13 is stable, please God, someday, uh, when we can use iOS 13 and this feature for, hey, if somebody's in my address book, let the phone ring, but otherwise send it to voicemail. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to want your address book to be, uh, you know, up up and running and, and correct and everything. So that's, uh, yeah, I I just can't say enough good stuff. It's one of the, if you have this issue and everybody does, it's sort of like, you know, making a new event in, a, in your calendar isn't that bad, but it's so much better with Fantastical. Card hops the same way. Well, and I would argue making a new contact with address book is much harder than making a new event in your calendar. Oh, so. absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And we talked about this recently on an episode of automators. Just I, I find it very useful for automation as well because it just gives you a line you can fill in. Uh, for a keyboard maestro, you can generate a contract entry and, and create a contract entry in Cardhop, whereas that's very difficult in the native address book app. So I've got some real cool automation nice stuff I do with Basecamp to set up contacts out of Basecamp through Keyboard Maestro into Cardhop. It's, it's just a cool app if you're if you're dealing a lot with contacts. What, what are some of the other Mac apps that, that uh, really strike your fancy these days? Uh, another one I, I just found recently is called Bumper uh, with no E, you know, in that way that uh, websites were a few years ago. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, like Choosy, uh, Choosy is still around. But it's a preference pane that lets you decide which browser you want to use for which website. But yeah. uh, Bumper does that. Uh, but it also does email clients. And I know we love talking about email clients, but I've got multiple uh, email clients set up on my Mac. I've got one that's, I separate my my church email stuff and my personal email stuff and my Gmail stuff. My Gmail is where I do all my mailing lists and everything like that. So uh, I click a mail link and it asks me if I want to open it uh, in one of those apps. And uh, it's just really, really cool little app. And I, I think it's free at this point. It might just be in beta, but uh, I, that was a new one that I just learned about uh, and have not seen anything else uh, that does that. Uh, and it's, it's a very cool um, yeah, little utility that, again, just makes life a little easier. Yeah, and obvious in hindsight. It's like, yeah, of course we have, we have web choosing apps. Why not have an email app? choosing app right and, yeah. and again this is one of the things on the mac where we can set our default apps but sometimes you still need to choose uh i, I love i love the day that i can do that on ios and because i've got multiple ios uh, email applications as well i mentioned downy uh, that's a great uh, app again for um uh for being uh, for downloading video from pretty much anywhere it's updated you know, at least weekly with, you know, some site has changed something. Uh, and that's, again, part of setup. You can you grab that. Uh, that's very cool. Yeah, uh, I would second that one. I, I got it also through setup and I find many uses for it. Yeah, that's uh, it, it's just very handy. And, you know, there, there are command line tools to do this, but this is this is really nice and it makes it so much easier. Uh, if you want to uh, do local backups of your iOS devices, um, there's this app called iMazing uh, that's uh, very, very useful. You can you set it up once with uh, by connecting uh, your iOS devices to uh, your Mac, and it does the first setup over USB, but then in the future, it'll uh, update wirelessly. And I do that uh, with my iOS devices and my family's iOS devices just just because we, we do have iCloud backup. But again, can you have too many backups? Uh, not in my world. Yeah, there's another one you have on your list that I wanted to talk about. I don't think we've ever mentioned on the show, but I'm a big fan of this one as well. Uh, Mac Pilot. Tell us about that one. Oh, Mac Pilot. Yeah, this is set up again. I mean, it, it's really handy because, uh, you know, if, if you didn't know of these apps or if it was just a little bit more than you wanted to to spend for something, uh, you can really get a good use out of out of it with set up. And um, but there there are a couple different apps that do this on the Mac. Some of them have come and gone. There used to be the the secrets 
uh, web uh, preference panel. <laughs> I've thought about that in a long time. <laughs> yeah, and, and it had like all those. Mac Pilot is the best app for finding those hidden preferences now. Uh, and it, it'll it'll help you with uh, you know running you know the the sort of routine maintenance stuff and and it, it it tries its best to sort of hold your hand and say hey do you really want to do this and I think it's got some features to to roll back if you uh, uh, you know do want to revert some changes that you've made but um, I've tried a bunch of these different apps and I think Mac Pilot is uh, by far the best one. Yeah, another one I also found through Setup and same thing. It's like Secrets was made by the same guy that made Quicksilver. Yes. And and then I don't know whatever happened to him. Maybe he works at Apple or Google or something. He's super smart. And um, I, don't, I don't know, but Secrets basically worked off a website and the website went away. And so now, it, now it's sad. So And so if you're listening, you're not familiar with these. It, it's an app that there's a whole bunch of like hidden terminal commands that you can use on the Mac to like precisely place the dock or just all sorts of goofy things or clear out your font cache, which uh, amazingly once in a while will fix a Mac. Um, but getting to that stuff is very cryptic. It's like, you feel like you have to have secret knowledge and that's why they had, the app was originally called secrets, you know, but right. the, uh, but the, uh, this Mac pilot has almost most of those same features, maybe a few more and a few less in different categories. But it's a great way to kind of get at the underpinnings of the Mac without um, getting into the terminal and making a mistake. Uh, it, it is an app you have to use with some knowledge, though. You can't just go in there and start blindly pushing buttons. You might break things. That's very true. And, and again, I, I think they do their best. They use a lot of tool tips to try to explain, you know, what things are going to do. But yeah, don't don't just go in there and start clicking around. But, uh, you know, take a little time. And if you want to get into tweaking some stuff, that that's probably the, the best and safest way to do it. You know, we we're just talking about setting default apps, and I should have remembered this app because it has the word default apps right in the name. Uh, Swift default apps. Uh, is a replacement for an old preference panel called RC Default Apps, which had kind of, I think, fallen by the wayside. I think it might still be 32 bits. Uh, and it will let you set all the sort of defaults. You can set your default text editor. You can set, if I click on a on a feed link and it wants to open Apple News and you're like, oh, there's no way I want you to open Apple News. Yeah. I want you to open <laughs> like an actual RSS reader uh, and those sorts of things. It's a free app. Uh, it's on GitHub again. And uh, again, it can be a little overwhelming the first time you look at it. But if you're looking to tweak that one, hey, I always want this app to open when I do this thing, uh, check out Swift default apps. Because yeah, that's one of the, those features in Mac OS, the Git info pane. So if you're in Finder and you hit Git, you know, file Git info, say on a JPEG, you can say, I want all my JPEGs to open in Photoshop and not preview or, or what have you. But there's so many things that we interact with on the Mac that there's not like there's not Git info for a link, right? To your point, you right. you had an RSS feed. It's like, I don't, why would I want you in Apple News? I have Reader sitting in my dock. So it sounds like this closes that gap. Absolutely. And it does things like it will let me set BB Edit as my default text editor, which is handy for some things that will t go for your default text. And I don't want to have to select every single you know, text file and text extension, or what if a file doesn't have a, a file extension at all, which is weird, but still happens. Um, and so I go in and I can do that there as well. All right. One more from the last time you were on the show many years ago uh, was tech text bar. And this is the geeky section gang, but I, yes. I just, I think this app is great and I'm glad that you're still using it. Tell us about it and how you're using it. Uh, text bar. I, I was waiting for this app for years and it finally happened and it's, it's most of what I am looking at in my menu bar comes from text bar. So it's an app that will let you run scripts and the output of the scripts go into your menu bar. Uh, so I have uh, m my most complicated one is I've got one that goes and uh, parses the Relay uh, FM website and tells me if there's a live show on right now, tells me what the last episode, that last show that was posted to the website and gives me links to uh, all the different shows and will tell me the next live show that's up there. It's right in my menu bar. Uh, I've got stuff for my battery levels, all this different cool stuff. If if you do anything with scripts, 
uh, at all and would ever, have ever thought, man, I wish I could put the output of this into my menu bar, uh, text bar is there for you. I think it's like $5 or something. I, I should have paid the guy $100 for this. Uh, Rich, if you're listening, um, that's not uh, that's not actually an offer. But, not uh, a contract. It, <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a cool app. Uh, and it, it really does. Uh, there was something called, I think, BitBar or something like this that uh, was a uh, it's pretty much dead at this point, but uh, yeah. uh, text bar is is alive and well, and uh, Rich is is my hero for making this app. Now, have you shared over at uh, Sounds Like Diploma? Have you shared some of the scripts for your text bar stuff? <laughs> now I'm going to have to buy a new website. It's rhymed with Diploma. <laughs> rhymes with Diploma. Well, sorry. Guys. <laughs> uh, I I have uh, I think text bar. I actually wrote about uh, on Mac Stories, so you can probably find some stuff there. All right. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, I definitely have written about that before. All right, we'll get some links because if you're listening and you heard, oh, it requires a script. I don't want to do that. No, download some of these sample scripts because you you can some of them you can just plug in and be done. Yeah, it comes with some built in too, and it, you know so. And Rich is really great about helping folks out. Uh, you know, if you're trying to do something and aren't sure how to do it, um, I'm sure he'd be he'd be happy to help too. Yeah, so it, it this is you should not be intimidated by this app, and it puts text in your in your menu bar. You know, I mean, I don't know what else to say. In your menu bar, and it's you like combine magic. it with Bartender to put all the junk you don't need you know, behind oh, bartender. Thank God for bartender. And then you've really got like a status board across the top of your iMac and uh, it's great. So uh, yeah, I, I love this app. Other than keyboard maestro, I think the thing I missed most about the Mac when I was on iOS was the menu bar because I, I had such, you know, I mean, bartender where, you know, that's another one of these apps that maybe everybody knows about, but I mean, where were we before that? I, I'd need a 27 inch laptop if I had to see all my menu bar items without a way to hide some of them. I had I had bartender turned off and I sent Steven a uh, screenshot for something we were doing outside the show and all he could I remember he wrote me back he's like that I can't look at that menu bar. <laughs> I brought I brought my Mac into the the Apple Store once and the the Apple Genius or whatever looked at my menu bar this is days before bartender and he's like dude dude you've got you've got too many apps running. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he was horrified. I was, yeah. You, you know, you have too many when you know that, like, you have to go to Finder to get to one of them because Finder has so right, many right. menu bar <laughs> Like, you know, the apps that, that expose more. Yeah. Or you, like, build your own dummy app that has no menu bar items. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do like, that, Steven? Did you get there? <laughs> there there is there is an app out there that was just called, like, Dummy Bar or something like that that had no menus from back in the day before bar- Bartender. Yeah, bartender saved us from that. Uh, terrible time that madness all right uh you also so talking apps some more you've been using the imac a lot i'm sorry you've been using the ipad a lot yes uh and we haven't talked to you about that on mac power user so tell us some of your favorite ipad apps that you discovered in your time on the uh on the trail with your ipad pro yeah the uh one of them that i love is uh fiery feeds uh, again, RSS is not dead, uh, despite uh, rumors. Uh, I love this app. This is one that I'm, I'm hoping will come to the Mac eventually, but uh, I don't read RSS on my Mac very often. I'll, I'll do that on the iPad. It's, it's very cool. Um, there's uh, there's just some, you know, it's got so many features. It's, it's again, it's a good a power user because you can tweak a lot of the ways that things look. Um, I use that with uh, Feedbin. Uh, and Feedbin will let you follow Twitter accounts as RSS feeds, uh, which I do for things uh, like Wirecutter. And I think uh, I think 9 to 5 Mac has a deals one. And I just, I don't want them in my Twitter feed. So I just put them into Feedbin and I can just uh, flick through them really quickly. Uh, and I do, uh, I do follow a lot of RSS feeds still. Uh, so that's really handy. Uh, one uh, that uh, I don't know that many people uh, know about is called Liquid Text. Uh, yes. One of the best things about the uh, 12.9 inch uh, iPad is uh, if I've got these old journal articles that are, are full full page PDFs, being able to read that whole thing. And Liquid Text is like magic for you know highlighting and you know focusing on just the important parts. I use that all the time, and and that Apple Pencil. Yeah, I tell Federico that he he cost me uh, I think one hundred and thirty dollars, one hundred for the pencil and thirty for liquid text because he was talking about it. And as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh, I, I definitely have to have that. That's just uh, there's no way around it. No, liquid text is a way to deal with PDFs on iPad that is rethought from the ground up. 
It's Absolutely. Like, and like one of the things I do with it is I have these long contracts. I pinch them and I can scrunch the document together and see two separate paragraphs. You know, one's on page two and the other one's on page 10. I can see them right next to each other and I can drag pieces of them out. I mean, it's just, uh, if you work with PDFs, try this app. Just try you, it. You really need to. It's, I mean, there yeah. are tons of PDF apps out there, but there's nothing else like liquid text. And I'm hoping that it's going to be possible at some point. I don't know if it will be this fall, but to see two liquid text files next to each other, because that would be handy too, but it's already so useful. Yeah. Yeah. And my wife uh, does a lot of audiobooks. She loves audiobooks. She's pretty much always uh, got an audiobook going. And uh, there's a, there's one called Bound uh, that's on the uh, App Store that will, if you've just got a bunch of MP3s that you've ripped, um, we'll go to like yard sales and stuff and people have them. Or uh, I've actually got some, the Chronicles of Narnia. I bought her on CD years ago, but I mean, <laughs> no one walks around with a Walkman anymore. Yeah. So yeah. I, I ripped those into uh, uh, on MP3s and I used to have to then, you know, make them into the proper audiobook format and whatever. Uh, Bound will pull a folder full of MP3s from Dropbox and just make it into an audiobook. And it's just so much easier. And uh, that's just the, the way to go for, uh, for that. If you like audiobooks, uh, definitely check that out. This is really cool. This is actually solving a, a problem that I have in my household right now. We're getting ready to go on this family vacation, and uh, we have some CDs of you know kids' audiobooks from the local library, and yep, can't take those with us. I was like thinking, like, do I rip them and do I make like a playlist in my wife's Apple Music account? But this, I just texted. I seriously just texted her this link. I said, download this on your phone. We're going to play with this this evening. <laughs> Yeah, this it, great. it's it's fantastic. And my wife does the same thing with with audiobooks. You know, she would <laughs> she would get CDs uh, from the um, from the library. Uh, and but at one point, she had a car that didn't have a CD player because that's becoming more and more common. She's sure. like, "How do I listen to these?" And so I would do the same thing. And and when she's done listening with it, we delete the MP3s. People, you know, we're not you know pirating or whatever. But uh, again, you know, that's just a good way of. Um, you know, using these things, especially if you've got, you know, I know kids re love to re-listen to things over and over again, just like movies. So, you know, as you were saying that, I was just thinking my Star Wars audio drama books, I loaned that to like a high school buddy like 10 years ago. Oh, no. I'm sitting here mad now. Well, I don't know I, if I'm ever going to get that back. I, I know exactly where mine are because I just ripped them not too long ago. So uh, drop me your address and I'll uh, <laughs> I'll share the link. You can, <laughs> you can cut hey, that out. Call Steve. that guy up. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, it's, that's great. Um, a couple more on your list that I think we'd want to call it clean text. I, I'm a big fan to basically tech soap for iPad. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's cheap and it's very simple to use. And, uh, again, when I was using the, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the Mac, I would do this with, again, I think Tick Soap is part of Setup. I keep yeah. saying, you'd think we'd be sponsored by Setup. They, they yeah. Call us, guys. Uh, but, well, uh, well clean they did text sponsor some of our live shows years ago. So Oh, did they? Okay, well, good, yeah. good. But clean text is great. Uh, it's, you know, just an easy way. And again, you can do some of this yourself, especially if you use Find, Replace, and whatever. But to just be able to hit one button and then get back to your life, uh, if you use BB Edit and know the uh, Zap Gremlins command, which is probably my favorite command, on the Mac, Zap Gremlins, just a great name. Uh, clean text will do pretty much uh, similar stuff on iOS until BB Edit comes to the iPad. Come on, Rich, you know you want to do it. That's right. I'm my, my subliminal messaging you, you to channeling. Rich yeah. Yes, yes. I'm okay, praying. One, la one last one on this list. You have one here I've never heard of. URL Manager. Oh yeah, URL Manager. This is, um, I think. Um, I think Brent uh, Terpstra uh, talked about that. Brett Terpstra talked about this at one point. But, yeah, you know, you get these long URLs. It's got all this tracking information and stuff, and you just want to clean it up. And uh, Brett had a, a Mac app for this, but uh, on, on iOS uh, URL manager, you just send it. It'll clean it up. It'll catch it down to, to just the actual stuff so you don't feel, you know, slimy sharing it on Twitter or wherever. Yeah, that's actually I think I'm going to have to download that app because that happens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will say that on the, the iPhone, uh, it seems to work a little better on the iPhone on the iPad. I, I, it works, but like there's a setting screen that like just doesn't come up. So I don't know. It just needs an update, I guess, but. 
This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by our friends over at Hover. If you've been thinking about building an online identity, you can get started with one simple step, buying a domain name. And with Hover, you will find the domain that shows the world who you are and what you're passionate about. I have used Hover for years. In fact, I just went through some renewals of some old domains related to 512 Pixels, my blog, including the old name it had before I rebranded and a bunch of you know URLs that are kind of close so someone mistypes it or uses the wrong TLD, it all redirects. And it was a good reminder of how long I've been working on the project, but how much it means to me. And it's nice to have a unique name and know that the domains are safe and sound because I have them registered at Hover. And Hover is great to work with. There are no upsells, and they use a really clean UI during the checkout process. Some of, the, some of these other companies, they're trying to trick you into buying things you don't need. Hover respects you as a customer, and they do everything they can to make the process easy and simple. And if you have any questions, you get in touch with their excellent support. But one thing I really love is the Hover Connect feature. So it allows you to connect your domain name to many website builders with just a few simple clicks. You know, DNS is not the easiest thing in the world, and Hover Connect kind of bypasses all that stuff. It makes it really easy to hook your domain name up to the website builder of your choice. Hover has over 400 domain name extensions to choose from, which can help brand yourself online. They have all the normal ones like .net, .com, .io, but maybe you want something a little spicier like .coffee, .ceo, or .photography. Whatever you want to showcase to the world, you can do it with Hover. If you're new to Hover, you can get 10% off any domain extension for the first year. Go on over to hover.com slash MPU. Make that first step towards building your online identity today. That URL, once again, is hover.com slash MPU. My thanks to Hover for their support of this show and Relay FM. One of the things, teacher, you're passionate about that I think we haven't covered enough on the show, at least lately, is just... Uh, content blocking and you know kind of protecting your internet in your home yeah and i know this is something you've given a lot of thought to and you've done some experimentation on share some thoughts with us uh, for folks listening that want to help sanitize the the internet a bit where they live yeah and i i mean i know this is a controversial thing for for folks who run websites that you know are are paid by ads, but the, the ads are just out of control. And I, I don't think anyone would uh, deny that. So uh, I've got an Eero at home, the first generation Eero. Uh, and I use the, uh, is it called Eero Plus, the subscription mm -hmm. service? Yep. Best deal on the internet, by the way. For 100 bucks a year, you get not only the Eero Plus service, you get uh, one password for families, which is usually $60 a month. And you get um a year a year yep and you get uh encrypt me uh used to be cloak for vpn also for families that alone was 100 bucks a year so i was paying 160 dollars a year uh even without euro plus so now i've got the euro plus and i'm spending less money and it also gives you malware bytes for mac uh which you know again whether or not you want to use that on your mac is up to you but it's a it's a well-respected you know malware protection for your mac and that is a you know an issue that uh, i think everyone needs to be aware of uh but the the, the thing with the Eero, uh it, it will block ads right at the the network level so you don't have to have any content blockers on there and i was looking one day you can you know check it out and see like you know how many ads it's blocked in the past week or so and I've got content blockers on my iOS devices, and my son and uh, uh, my son and my wife do not, uh, just because I didn't want to have to explain to them how it works and everything. And the difference that those content blockers on iOS make—I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of ads per week that the arrow is blocking, uh, and that the content blockers are blocking. I mean, it's it's not a few; it's a ton of them. And yeah, it's just something that, you know, it, it prevents you from getting, you know, scroll jacked when you're scrolling along and all of a sudden you're, you know, the web page takes over and does something else. Uh, I, I've just, you know, I've just committed myself to that. I'm using, what is it? One blocker X uh, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, is one of the ones that I'm using. Uh, I'm again, flipping uh, quickly into the uh, settings, uh, vamp for time. Uh, content blockers. Okay, one blocker X, and the other one is called Better. Uh, and then the last one is Unobstruct, which I think is specifically for like newsletters and such. Uh, 
Uh, if you really want to pare down the web and pr pretty much break it, you can use something called Speed Afari, like Safari, but with speed in it. Yeah. Uh, and you got to go in there and really tweak the settings. I have it at its very lowest setting because if you turn it up to like medium and high, it will like it won't load images, it won't load JavaScript, it won't load anything, which of course breaks most of the internet. But um, yeah, I've got it and, you know, one blocker X or 10, I'm not sure which one they go with. It blocks ads, adult site, annoyances, comments, social trackers, um, and all those things. And it's just everywhere. And it's just, it's creepy and gross to, you know, be on one site and realize that you've been tracked from another. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, I, I usually like, I, you have a trust until trust is broken kind of attitude. And if a website throws a bunch of garbage at me, I will block them. But otherwise, I let them through. But the thing that I like about the Eero Plus service, I, I am a customer as well. And they are occasionally a sponsor of the show. So everybody, but I, I pay the money for it. I, I bought my Eero's and I, I pay for the service. Yep. But the, the reason I like it is I still have a lot of teenagers visiting the house. And I just like being able to know that they're not going to get on any parts of the internet. I don't really want them to get on from my house. And, uh, and people tell me, well, they can go get on it at home or whatever. And that's fine. But I just don't want them getting on it on my Wi-Fi. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just, and that's, a, and sometimes it can even be an innocent thing where it's like, you know, they yeah. clicked on something and four links later, they're looking at, you know, stuff they didn't expect to. And, you know, the arrow just gets in the way and they're going to go, oh, well, I, that wasn't that important enough for me to go bother dad about. Um, I've got I've got this stuff turned on and I'll tell you that, you know, again, you can see um, uh, if it's block stuff and we haven't run into any. But I've run into a couple where it's like I'll find a, an old link to, uh, you know, web page that the, the domain lapsed and somebody took it over. And now it's trying to, you know, get you to download some, you know, something that claims to be a, a flash installer that is really a, a malware installer. And uh, so it's just a, an ounce of protection. Yeah, you, you do stumble into this stuff. And, and I do think as uh, responsible adults, you know, it's it's within our grasp, whether it's Eero Plus or some other service to uh, to find a way to kind of block that stuff and, and maybe have a little safer experience for the folks in your home. Yeah, absolutely. Do you doing that, Stephen? Yeah, and I'm using uh, Eero Plus as well for, yeah. for that stuff. You know, I've got one blocker X 10, whatever, uh, on my iOS device for, for some content blocking and, and ad blocking there. But the network is, uh, is protected from, from Eero plus, uh, I also have a, a Disney home circle, uh, which they're sponsored for some of my other shows. I have that set up for some additional stuff just for my kids devices. I haven't rolled that out. I'm kind of comparing the two either way. I end up going, I got to say like, this is so much easier than it used to be. I mean, it used to be that to do this, you have to like, yeah run your own DNS server or block stuff or, you know, use some obscure thing. And uh, I like that these services have made it so much easier for, for parents or just people who just want a, a cleaner internet. You know, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist anymore. Yeah. And, and with these services, you cut it off at the pipeline, you cut it off right as it comes in the house, mm -hmm. and, which is before it was like app specific or device specific. And so that was a whole different problem. Yeah. And, you know, I get, before we turn this into commercial for Eero, but, you know, one of the things I, I this is just a real story of I've, I've got some friends who, you know, they have a, a strict no devices after bedtime policy and uh, all the stuff. And, and, you know, with Eero, you can, you know, set of profiles and, you know, turn off your kids' uh, devices. Uh, and they've got a teenager who snuck an iPod touch into the house and uh, was using that and staying up all night, uh, iMessaging and everything like that. It, I mean, to the point where it was like affecting their ability to go to school in the morning because they weren't getting any sleep. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, you know, if they were doing that on the Eero, what would have happened is I would have got a little pop-up notification that a new device had <laughs> had connected to my network and I could have gone in and blocked it and that would have been the end of that. But, uh, you know, it, it's tough out there. It really is. And, and you know, it, as parents, you want to do the best stuff you can. And uh, sometimes the kids need a little more uh, encouragement uh, and uh, oversight. And, you know, I, I think it's always important to find a balance with that stuff. But, um, you know, it's... It is important. 
All right. Well, TJ, it's so great having you back on Mac Power Users and uh, hearing all the fun things you've been up to over these last few years. When I heard you were doing an iPad, I'm like, oh, that's good. We're going to have some <laughs> great stuff from TJ next time we get him on MPU. It sounds like you're using both the, the iPad and the Mac still. It's not one or the other at this point. Yeah, it, it really, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying them both. I'm glad to have a Mac again that I can use. But, uh, you know, the, the time with the iPad really did show me that, you know, there's so much stuff that you could do on this. And, you know, the, the the whole argument about, you know, which device to use. And I think Jason Snell has said this, you know, a number of times of, you know, he, he likes both. He uses both. He's not going to be an either or. But, you know, he wants both of them to be as good as he can. I think that's most of us. Right. And uh, um, and again, it's just so much fun to be able to, you know, sit somewhere with a screen I can touch and uh, do that. Or and again, the 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 built in cellular uh, that's, you know, again, I I. I, when they originally announced the iPad with built-in cellular, I was like, oh, wow, I can't wait for that price to come down. And uh, 10 years later, we're still waiting. Yeah. But it's just <laughs> so nice to be able to, you know, open it up and it's just online. And I'll do that some, you know, even if a place has built-in Wi-Fi uh, at a restaurant or something, I'll pull out the iPad just because I know I've got my own connection and, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, getting on their Wi-Fi and going through their whole, you know, uh, capture portal and all this stuff. So no, the iPad is definitely here to stay. And uh, now I've got two, you know, 13 inch screens, then I can work with them together. Yeah. I, I always tell people I'm not team iPad or team Mac. I'm team both. I mean, I want them both to be great. And yeah, um, absolutely. And I find uses for both of them. And, and I'm, I'm really glad, but I'm just glad we got your nerd brain working on the iPad now too, because that's going to just benefit <laughs> us all. <laughs> well, once uh, once iOS 13 comes out, I think Shortcuts is really going to just have a huge uh, uptick with uh, all the different stuff it can do. I'm really excited about the, the way they've really built that into the system and, and really look forward to that. So uh, maybe we'll do a, a, a Shortcuts show someday. Yeah, I, I've outed myself. I'm doing a brand new field guide on Shortcuts because it's so different that you just have to start from scratch again. But it is so much more accessible now i mean it was good before but it is great now they've it's it's yeah i can't get over how much it's changed in one year you know we were worried you're talking in the show earlier about will this even survive and yeah. not only survive this thing is like got deep roots in the system and now it is here that you couldn't get it out with dynamite at this point <laughs> i i have a secret theory that that tim cook likes shortcuts i don't know why i have no proof of this but it's just so it's gotten so much attention and love that i'm like wonder if tim is secretly into ios automation and uh, i'm just going to believe that until uh, i'm proven false never <laughs> I, I think maybe the shortcuts seems to be a lot of time working on numbers integration <laughs> it's great for spreadsheets well I, I, and seriously I, I believe tim cook is actually a pretty serious ipad user like yep. you know for the type of work he does that would make sense um so i could see him using it all right well listen f where should folks go to find you uh rhymes with not sounds with rhymes with diploma.com yeah uh, i i am on twitter uh not as much lately because well we all know why uh but uh i do read my app mentions all the time and i do pop in uh, occasionally and, and read stuff there and i i, I like twitter i i want to like twitter more but uh it's, it's a struggle some days and uh but yeah uh you can reach me through my website if you want or twitter or uh, you can find some of my scripts and stuff on uh, github i'm tj luoma there also well, thank you again so much for coming on, and uh, we will see you again in the near future. We are the Mac Power Users. Thank you to our sponsors, 1Password, Smile, Direct Mail, and Hover, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>